Helen, thank you very much. Thank you all for being here. It's really a great pleasure. As you just heard, uh, my name is Dan Esty. I'm a professor at the Yale Law School and the Yale School of Forestry and Environmental Studies. And perhaps more importantly for today's purposes, I was one of the US negotiators of the Framework Convention on Climate Change of 1992 when I was then at the US Environmental Protection Agency. And I want to start our program by saying I think we made some mistakes with that Framework Convention mistakes that the 2015 Paris Agreement begins to change. And perhaps the most significant one was believing that national governments could do the job of addressing climate change. We set up a rather top-down focus on targets and timetables set by national governments. And uh, lo and behold, 20 years later, we had not delivered much in the way of emissions reduction. So the Paris Agreement shifts gears in fundamental ways, builds much more of a bottom-up implementation strategy behind these ambitious goals, uh, preventing warning, warming from going above two degrees, aiming at a 1.5 degree cap on that warming. And we recognize, and the Paris Agreement formally acknowledges, that that's going to take a lot of work by subnational leaders and by the corporate world and the NGO community. And today we have uh, on the stage some climate leaders that represent that transition to a much more bottom-up strategy of addressing climate change. And we're going to have a conversation, uh, a kind of a quick back and forth across a range of issues and representing the range of perspectives that our panel here offers. So let me start, if I can, with the Premier of Quebec, uh, uh, Philippe Couillard. And uh, Mr. Premier, your province has been a leader on climate change for a very long time. And uh, you were one of the people that really helped guide the world community towards this more bottom-up strategy, recognizing the important opportunities that exist at a state or provincial level. But you've also said that it's not just going to be state by state, province by province. You all have to be seen as part of a global action plan. What's your perspective on that? Uh, first, it's our responsibility to not only build but grow alliances. I can speak of three types of alliances that we're part of. The first one would be operational. Obviously, this is a carbon market that Quebec is part of with California. Soon with Ontario. Ontario and Quebec, 50% of Canada's population under a carbon market. Who would have said that a few years ago? Just a, one figure for you, 60%. Once China has achieved its national carbon market project, 60% of the world's GDP will be covered by a carbon market. That's something to remember, something to say. So that's an operational alliance. Political alliances as well are important. Uh, this is why we are part of the Alliance of States and Regions of the Climate Group. And as you said, most of the jurisdiction and levers are at that level of jurisdiction. State, provinces, large cities. And we want to be still part of that and grow this alliance and collaborate with new alliances coming forward. I heard a very encouraging sign from Governor Brown and his colleagues of forming an alliance of US states that are still, in spite of what's happening in Washington, DC, very active in the fight against climate change. Obviously, we will want to collaborate with these type of alliances. And the third type of alliance is global action. Uh, you know, I think it's our responsibility as developed economy to participate in solutions for the emerging countries uh, who are, of course, facing desertification and significant challenges uh, all around the world. So we've set up a 25 million fund to call for projects, particularly in Western Africa, uh, joint with Quebec NGOs and other organizations for local ground level projects to fight climate change. And we have had tremendous success. All the projects now have been selected and going forward. We also made a contribution to the Global Fund for uh, Less Favored Country, uh, the UN, and also a youth, part of the budget goes for youth initiatives. So, you know, operational, political, global, this is how we have to act. To act. And remember that when times are more difficult and when large national leaders, for some reasons, decide to withdraw, this is where our level of jurisdiction becomes particularly important. Well, it does seem like the uh, critical energy in many countries, uh, including the United States, has now shifted from the national government to the state and local lever level. Uh, governors and mayors are leading the charge. Uh, Governor Jay Inslee of Washington, uh, you have been leading the charge to put a price on carbon and uh, exploring various ways to do that. Uh, a little bit of a setback with a referendum, but maybe this opens the way for a better approach to uh, doing that. And certainly there's lots of folks thinking now that the critical steps forward on the policy or perspective in the United States are going to come at the state level. How's it going in Washington state? Well, it's going great, and I'm so pleased to be here with the leaders of the can-do coalition. That's what I would call us. <laughs> because we are, the, we are the group. And I, 
I actually think this is really an important message that we are the optimists in this, in this group. We are the ones who believe uh, we need to overcome fear and see the positive belief on this, and that's why we're being so successful. Um, in fact, it's interesting, I was in Seattle the other day at a forum and a, 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 a questioner asked, you know, aren't these the darkest days like in American history? You know, my forests are burning down, there's ash falling in Seattle, it's never happened before. We have these intense hurricanes, massive melt in Greenland, rising sea levels, Fiji, Tuvalu, Marshall Islands threatened. Aren't these the darkest days? And I answered by quoting one of my favorite Winston Churchill quotes when he would walk through the streets of London during the Blitz and the smoke was, you couldn't even see St. Paul's Cathedral and somebody asked him the same question and he said, these are not dark days, these are great days because if the British Empire lasts a thousand years, they will look back at these times as the finest hours. And I believe the same energy needs, in, is uh, animating what we're doing here. It's why after the climate denier in the White House uh, pulled out of Paris, within 36 hours, we had 13 states ready to go to defeat climate change. And the reason we did that is we fundament, uh, fundamentally understand two things. Number one, we have to have victory because without victory, there is not survival. And number two, we understand this is an economic growth opportunity for our people. It's not an accident that CNBC listed Washington State as the best place to do business, with all due respect to my partners here who've done great work, <laughs> <laughs> because they're leading, the, they're, they're ahead of the average growth as well in the United States. We have like double the GDP, average GDP in the United States, in large part because we have a clean energy policy to build these businesses. So I have put in place by executive order uh, a cap, an absolute cap on carbon dioxide. That is the right thing for Washington State. It is one of the reasons we have grown our economy so rapidly. It is one of the reasons we have the world's largest vanadium flow battery manufacturing, uh, manufacturing company, the world's largest uh, manufacturer of substrate for carbon uh, fiber that goes into electric cars. Our economies are blossoming of the can-do caucus because we understand this is an economic uh, growth strategy. So I'm excited about this effort, and I'll just finish my comment in respect to the tremendous leadership of Quebec and, and your leadership team. Um, another reason this is so important is to send the right message from the United States to the rest of the world. We cannot allow the rest of the world to backslide because of the current occupant of the White Houses wanting to run up the white flag of surrender of, of, uh, against this challenge. We cannot allow that. We need to send a message to the rest of the world we're there. The United States Climate Alliance, which Governor Brown, Governor Cuomo, and myself helped form, now represents about 40% of the United States economy. We would be the third largest economy in the world if we were one country. I'm not suggesting that. That would be a constitutional <laughs> crisis. But we are something big, and we need to send the message to the world. Go uh, Colonel Stanton showed up in World War I. We were late to World War I, but he showed up and he went to the tomb of Lafayette and said, Lafayette, we are here. Well, Lafayette, we are here. We're sending a message to Paris. We're ready to be the Candu Caucus, and we're going to win this. Thank you very much. Uh, Stephen Badger. <laughs> Stephen Badger, Chairman of the Board of Mars. Um, one of the things that the Paris Agreement did was galvanize the business community. And it seems quite uh, impressive to see how many companies have said they're going forward uh, with the action plans they put in place and they see climate action as part of their business strategies. Um, what's your take on how the business community is dealing with the current circumstances and are they maintaining an ambitious climate change action program on a broad basis? Sure, thank you. Uh, well, let me first say I'm honored to be here indeed and to share the stage with uh, such esteemed officials and yourself, Dan. Uh, yes, uh, well, that came out the wrong way, uh, I really truly did. Uh, the greatest of respect for your green to gold, you've led the way in helping to, to lay an academic and rational foundation. No need to waste time on that, thank you. <laughs> okay. um, so let me get to the point. Business is indeed stepping up and uh, we at Mars are stepping up and I'm honored to be here on behalf of business uh, to speak to that end. For those of you in the audience who don't know Mars, just a, a quick moment on that. Uh, you probably know our brand, Snickers, M&M's, Pedigree, Whiskas, uh, Seeds of Change, uh, but you wouldn't know our company. Uh, we're over a hundred, many of you wouldn't. Uh, we're over a hundred years old. 
My great-grandfather started it in his kitchen, and we very much stayed out of the limelight historically. But with the magnitude of this issue and the importance of it to not only our business but to the planet at large, we've decided that it's it, we really do need to step into the fray and we need to do so publicly. And so not only are we all in per the Paris Accord, we're uh, still in, rather, I, we would say that we're all in. And we're all in really on the basis of the science. The science is very clear, and the science is such that we're now able to map the carbon footprint of our total supply chain. And it has the footprint equal to a country the size of Panama. And that's significant, and we bear a responsibility for that. And in fact, to that end, we're very firm in our commitment to make an absolute reduction of two-thirds of the greenhouse gases in our supply chain, which would get us in line with the Paris Accord, and to do that through real investments and real activities and a whole nother level of investments and activities. Uh, so we're actually calling it our Sustainable in a Generation Plan. We're spending upwards of a billion dollars over the next several years, and it will not only address uh, the likes of climate change, it will address a range of issues that people as well are facing in our supply chain, from poverty uh, to human rights issues, et cetera. So I think business is, is critical for, for solving these issues. Um, it's critical that business do it in partnership with uh, governments, uh, with industry partners as well, with governments, uh, as well as NGOs and the civil society. And we are fundamentally committed to doing our part. So thank you. Well, thank you very much. And thank you on behalf of all of us for the leadership in the business community. Uh, it is impressive the commitments Mars has made and the efforts you're leading. But if anyone can top them, maybe it is the governor of Hawaii, David yes. Ige. Um, governor, uh, your state has committed to going 100% renewable uh, by 2045. This represents one of the most ambitious commitments uh, of any entity, of any state, city, uh, company in the world. How are you going to get there? You know, uh, we are proud uh, in Hawaii. You know, Hawaii is the most isolated community on the planet. You know, we're 2,500 miles away from any other community. Uh, the people of the First Nation of Hawaii uh, were a model of sustainability. They had generated 100% of their energy and product needs um, from themselves. Uh, Ten years ago, Hawaii was the most dependent community on the planet, importing 90% of our fossil fuels for electricity uh, and importing more than 90% of the food uh, and goods that we need to sustain ourselves. Mm -hmm. And our community absolutely said that does not work anymore. Mm -hmm. Two years ago, we embraced the goal of 100% renewable energy for electricity generation because we wanted to transform our economy. We knew that becoming sustainable, becoming self-reliant would create new job opportunities uh, and make us a more sustainable community. I'm fortunate that the people of Hawaii truly understand why that's important, and that's why we became the first state in the nation to commit to 100% renewable. We have an abundance of natural resources that assures us that we will make this goal. Um, Governor Inslee talks about being the can-do people and the can-do uh, can philosophy and the philosophy of hope, and we definitely embrace that uh, in Hawaii. Uh, we know that we can generate 100% of the energy that we need. Uh, on the island of Kauai today, um, during the peak sunshine hours, we generate 99% of the energy needs on Kauai <coughs> through solar, through hydroelectric, through the first uh, closed cycle biomass production plant. Um, so we know that the challenge before us is about storage, uh, is about how can we take the energy that is so abundant in our natural environment, store it, and produce it for when the consumer needs it. Uh, we are excited about that opportunity. We already see job growth in green energy. Uh, we have the highest employment uh, ever in the history of the state of Hawaii. Uh, and we continue to march on this commitment to 100% renewable. Uh, two months ago, Hawaii became the first state in the country to legally commit to the goals of the Paris Agreement 
again, it really is a reflection of our community belief that climate change is real, that we need to take uh, dramatic action, uh, and we will continue to do so. So, Governor Ige, thank you very much. Um, Governor Brown, you've been a leader on climate change for years. Uh, you were one of the people that helped uh, launch the Under Two Coalition. More recently, you've been leading the U.S. Climate Alliance. Are you optimistic that we can actually move forward despite the difficult political moment we are in in this country? Well, that's a very good question. Um, I like all the optimism around here, so that's good. Uh, but I don't want to minimize uh, the steep hill that we have to climb. Uh, decarbonizing the economy when the economy depends so totally on carbon is not child's play. This is, uh, it's quite daunting. But the optimism that I hear in this room and I see from my fellow governors and with the representative business is a real step forward. We weren't this far a year ago. So we're making progress. And that, that's very exciting. And I can say in California, we've taken a number of steps. Um, and I would say very significantly in our recent passage of the most comprehensive cap and trade program anywhere in the, in the United States. And we're linked with Quebec in our carbon market. Um, that uh, law was extended to 2030 and was done with the benefit of nine Republican votes. Now that represents about 10% uh, of, of the legislature, but it's the first time that I know of where Republican representatives have voted for a climate uh, action explicitly by the name of climate action. They, they didn't mess around and say it's something else. They explicitly recognized that. So that's a real <coughs> crack in the, armory, in the armor of Republican climate denial. And I think that's gonna spread uh, to other parts of the, of the party, and that's very important. Uh, other things we're doing in California, we're about almost 30% renewable. We'll be at 50% probably in the next seven years, and we'll go beyond that um, and follow Hawaii with their 100%, um, but we're already at uh, just under 30. We have a 10% uh, low-carbon fuel standard, uh, which is a very uh, tough mandate on energy producers, but we're, we're getting there. We're probably three or four percent now, and we're moving up to 10. Uh, as I said, we have the cap and trade. We have a mandate for zero emission vehicles. We have several hundred thousand uh, on the road already. I know she said there are a million in the world. California, I think, is close to 300,000 right now, so we're like 30 percent. And then we have building standards, strictest in the country, and we have appliance standards. And then on top of all that, we are joining together with Washington, Quebec, and Hawaii and other places in this under two coalition. So uh, states and provinces representing over a billion people are committed to the Paris Agreement. So that's a real positive. Uh, we're committed, now we have to operationalize. And therein is the gap here between uh, our commitment and then making it really happen. So yeah, I, I think the optimism is good but I think a healthy dose of realism, uh, how difficult this is. We need the technology that doesn't exist yet. We need battery storage capability that doesn't <coughs> exist at the level we need to really introduce uh, widespread renewable energy. But we're getting there. And uh, the fact that we're here in New York at the UN, uh, this is a real positive sign. We've got to keep it going. But there are powerful climate deniers. And they're in very powerful positions, not just the White House, but uh, at the commanding heights of our corporate economy. So the fact that we have all these uh, corporations represented, that's really good. But we need more. We've got to keep it going. And meetings like this are steps along the way uh, on the journey uh, that we're making to a decarbonized world. And I say the sooner the better. <laughs> Thank you, Governor Brown. All of you are climate leaders, and all of you are pushing your states and your businesses forward, uh, and your province, of course. And uh, here's the question I want to pose next. One of the other things that 
meetings of this kind provide and where we bring the leaders forward is a chance to highlight what others might follow. So I want to ask each of you, what if you could, you would suggest to others who are in the same place, a, a premier in a Canadian province or anywhere in the world, uh, an American state governor or a business leader, what is it you would tell your community is the next important step to take to keep climate action going? Premier? Setting targets, uh, adopting legislation and uh, action that is coherent with the targets we, we, uh, we advocate for. And California has been a great example for us, not only with the carbon market, but the recently adopted law that mandates also zero emission vehicles in Quebec, exactly on the model of uh, what California did a few years ago. But we are still the only province in Canada that has adopted such a legislation, where I, which I, I think is part of the, uh, of the general area of tools that we all have to deploy. So first, of course, accepting the existence of the problem. I don't think it's an issue in this room, but I know it's an issue elsewhere and not far from here. Uh, and also uh, taking action that is coherent with uh, objectives. I always worry a little bit, a little bit about long-term objectives that are very ambitious because obviously uh, we're all very healthy, but none of us probably will be there in 2045 or 2050. And we set targets for that time, which is good, but we have to realize also that we don't know what the world will look like in these years, and it's hard for us to control the long term. But we can certainly act <coughs> now in 2030, maybe 2040, in a credible way. Because in order to succeed politically, we have to achieve two things. First, to remain credible and coherent. And second, to destroy the argument that acting on climate is bad for the economy. For example, in Quebec, there has been a stunning reversal of our economic uh, situation in the recent three years. We now are seen as an example of sound fiscal management and economic uh, growth in, in Canada, in spite of having all these policies, or because maybe of having all these policies on, on climate. So that's something also that is essential, showing practically that climate, climate action and economy go well together. Just one example to finish my remarks. Uh, the largest, one of the largest investment, public investment uh, project in Quebec is a, a large electric train, which will be the fourth largest in the world in Montreal built with, of course, supplied by hydroelectricity <coughs> made with water, not uh, fossil fuels. Uh, cars made with aluminium, again, made through hydroelectricity, not fossil fuels. So all, work, all this works together and creates literally thousands of jobs. So sometimes we're accused by climate deniers that we want to destroy the economy. Well, this is totally false now, and we can actually show very practical examples in each of our jurisdictions and all around the world, actually, that speak to the contrary. So, again, setting objectives, being coherent politically and in, in our actions, and showing practical examples of job creation and prosperity. Because there's always a fine line uh, in the environmental movement where you lose the support of the people. When people start worrying about what's going to happen to my job, my family, my community, is it bad, this, all these initiatives, are they going to be bad for my community? This is where you lose the people's support. So we have to be very, very attached to that. Thank you. Governor Inslee, what would you say to others who are stepping up to the issue, perhaps not quite as far down the track as you are? I would say you should clone Jerry Brown and try to get him to do some good work. <laughs> He's been such a great leader on this, Governor. Um, <clears throat> just a brief story, what uh, instructive from Washington State. So in the mid-2000s, uh, when this problem became so apparent, I banded together with a bunch of group to do an initiative to have a renewable energy portfolio standard in our state. And when we took this to the people, of course, the opposition, the fossil fuel industry came forward and said, this is going to shut down the Washington state economy. We're going to have mass unemployment. Electrical rates will skyrocket. Uh, this will be the doom and gloom of all time. We passed it. It was narrow, but we passed it. Two things happened. I think both messages are important. Number one, we now have an excess of 75% of all our energy in our electrical grid is, um, uh, is clean energy, zero CO2 emitting uh, a generating capacity. But here's the message that's most important. Uh, my wife Trudy and I, we went up and to look at some of our fires and I watched the fires that were burning right up to one of our new uh, uh, wind turbines. We now have 3,500 megawatts when we had zero before we passed this initiative. And uh, we were just taking pictures of these wind turbines in this white pickup truck came down the, the road and the guy stopped I just said hello to the driver, and I said, what are you doing? He says, I'm maintaining these wind turbines. And I go, well, what is, you know, just tell me about it. How do you, what, is, what does climate change and clean energy mean to you? 
And he looked at me, and I was a congressman at the time. He says, Congressman, I'll tell you what climate change mean to me, means to me. It means this brand new white pickup. And he slams his hand <laughs> on, the, on the hood of this beautiful, I think it was a Dodge pickup. Uh, that's the fundamental message that we have to win races on. And let me finish on that note. We need to make this a winning political message. It is a winning political message because the job creation is the greatest opportunity for job creation. The fastest growth of any sector of the United States economy today is clean energy. And if we will make this an aggressive message, we will win. I got elected governor on this message in 2012. And there's two messages. Number one, President Trump and all his tweets cannot stop any of our states from moving forward. We fought him on the refugee ban. We're fighting him on DACA. But we are beating him on clean energy because he cannot stop any of the things we're doing. He's powerless in that regard. And we're going to win this at the ballot box as well. Thank you. Stephen, what do you... <laughs> Stephen, what do you say to other business leaders? And, and let me just put a twist on this. There are business leaders who are still skeptical. And, and how do you get them thinking in a new and different way about climate change? Sure. Well, I think the, the overwhelming thing that I would say is that there is a business rationale to investing in sustainability, uh, full stop. Uh, every dollar that we're spending on sustainability has, has been taken through a rigorous analysis. And you might think as a privately held company that we, and because we don't have to meet quarterly earnings targets and such, that we don't have to be as rigorous with our financial acumen. But that's, that's just not the case. Uh, you, one doesn't stay in business for over 100 years without being very disciplined about how you're spending your money and how you're deploying your capital. And so for us, there are three buckets that we really focus on. We focus on the planet, we fo focus on our supply chain and the people in it, uh, and, and those beyond our supply chain also in terms of customers and consumers, and we focus on well-being uh, at large for pets and people. And I would say again that there are uh, really three ways that I would think about that business case. There's, there's uh, cost neutrality or cost benefit. There's cost avoidance and there's reward. And so today already with our operations in the U.S. and elsewhere, which are carbon neutral uh, from wind and other sources, we're already finding our, our, uh, our bills to be less than what we would pay with fossil fuels. So there's, there's cost benefit, or at least neutrality, and, and it's only going to get better. In terms of cost avoidance, climate change is a serious disruptor to any business that has a supply chain based upon any agricultural commodity. Uh, it just is, is, is going to uh, fundamentally alter the security of, of food grown on the face of the earth. And so as a company that, that essentially buys raw materials and puts them together into finished goods, uh, investing in our supply chain and in the resilience, resiliency of it uh, and, in, and doing what we can in, uh, in our part, for our part, to address climate change only makes good business sense. And then there's a reward to it as well relative to uh, whether that be consumers themselves, customers such as retailers, uh, or others, who employees, who uh, will seek out and find value in engaging with companies that, uh, and entities that are really trying to make a positive difference in the world and on this issue uh, in specific. Thank you. Governor Ige, the same question. Do you have a thought that you would share with others? And again, not only U.S. states, but provinces and states, uh, subnational leaders around the world. Certainly, I do think that uh, having goals are important. Um, you know, the Aloha Plus challenge is something that we uh, announced in Hawaii a couple years ago, and it really focused on sustainability of our community uh, on, in terms of energy, in terms of food production, in terms of uh, taking care of our natural resources, our uh, ocean and water resources, and then most importantly from Hawaii, um, keeping out invasive species and managing you know, th those species that are unique to Hawaii, like um, found nowhere else in, on the planet. Uh, we found very helpful to pursue legislation because it allows the community and all stakeholders to get involved. Uh, and we saw a tremendous <coughs> consensus in our community. You know, as an island community, we see the impacts of climate change more dramatically than, than other communities. You know, the last two hurricane seasons were the busiest and most active uh, in recorded history in the state of Hawaii. 
at one point in time, we had three Category 4 storms surrounding the islands. Never before in the history have we ever seen that. We've had more extreme tides. We've had uh, dramatic coral bleaching events that threaten our ocean resources. So our community is directly impacted by climate change. And we have set aspirational goals, aggressive goals, because we understand that uh, island communities are on the front lines. And if we don't take action, and if we don't lead by example, then we have no one to blame but ourselves. Thank you. Governor Brown, I, um, I, I want to pick up on something you said uh, in adding to this question. And that is, you mentioned in California you've begun to build a bipartisan coalition to move this agenda forward. And it strikes me that that's something that's critical across the United States more broadly. What's the key to building back again a, a Republican party that thinks about this issue in similar ways or at least comes together as you've been able to do in California on moving the agenda forward? Well, the key is to change public opinion so that the representatives feel comfortable in uh, embracing various actions regarding climate change. And that's happening. Uh, the, the, the world is changing. In fact, ironically, with President Trump's election, uh, the climate change awareness has grown. It's jumped in, in the political uh, uh, surveys that we see. So, look, the, the, the world we live in is in part law, a creature of law, government, government rules and taxes, and in a very large part, private business, profit-making enterprise. The two have to go together. The law is subject to the politics. The politics is subject to the money, to the influence of the corporate world. We're here with a lot of corporate representatives. That's critical. We need more corporate um, action and awareness about the climate uh, issue. Now, the whole climate as a politician, and I've been doing this for a long time. My first office was in 1969, so I've been at this thing for a while. Uh, climate change is not a hot political topic. It's too general, too global, too remote. So the challenge is to make it concrete. And we make it concrete by more and more people uh, understanding and uh, focusing and embracing the topic. It's a hard thing to talk about. Climate change is a wipeout at some point. And there are tipping points that we don't know. Have we passed them? Will we pass them in five years, 10 years, 20 years? We don't know. So it's a huge catastrophic threat that is still rather vague in political terms. So we need uh, the media, we need corporations. Uh, what I'm hearing from Mars, very important. This is key. We got to convert some oil companies. Uh, that's we politicians are have a role, but our role is embedded in a capitalist economy where money and profit and loss is the engine, not the only engine, but a powerful engine. So what we're doing today is really a, absolutely what we need to do. We got to keep doing it and and keeping increasing it. And just as a point of of optimism here, because I'm not given to optimism, I'm given to deep pessimism. <laughs> But I really enjoy deep pessimism. So it's actually a perverse form of optimism. And I, I won't explain that because I don't understand it myself. Because I'm very excited. The more the danger rises, the more excited I get to be doing what I'm doing. I can't explain that myself. So, um, anyway, here we are. And um, one example. Well, two. The, the electric companies in California said they could never get to 20% renewable energy by 2020. That was their line 10 years ago. They're now 27% in 2017. And now they have embraced 50%. So that, that's a transition from real corporate leaders thinking one thing 10 years ago, thinking the exact opposite now. I'll give you another example. When I was Attorney General, uh, I was pushing the idea, someone pushed me, and uh, I pushed uh, in turn to get uh, battery storage. And what I mean by that is I pushed a bill to have the utilities, the electric companies in California 
be required by law to purchase uh, 1,300 megawatts of storage by 2020. They can't do that, they said. They killed the bill, two years running. But finally, we got it passed a couple of years ago, and now the utilities are well on their way to buying 1,300 megawatts of storage. We are driving a technology, driving the cost down. That's crucial. We need battery technology. That takes billions of dollars of investment. So it's, it's the scientists, it's the business, it's the technology, it's the politicians, it's the media. It's all interactive. And um, so, but there's some good news. So we are making progress. The progress we've made is rather tiny compared to where we got to go. So how do we have a clear view of how little we've come relative to where we go, but to have enough confidence to make the commitments. And it, this is really turning it around. And it can be done. And you, uh, one more thought here about kind of what we have to do. In World War II, uh, on some day, somewhere in 1942, I think, early on, Roosevelt said, no more private cars. No more. Done. We're doing tanks, liberty ships, and airplanes. Well, at some point, somebody's got to say, no more fossil fuel cars. And they're beginning to say it. They're saying it uh, uh, in Norway. They're saying it in, in these other countries. So that's the level of leadership. And we need it coming from the president and the prime ministers. And when we don't have that, we need to have the lower level folk like us. We are the lower level folk who have to push the big people. And the big people aren't quite there yet. But they're going to get there, and they're going to get there because of all the people that have made this happen this morning. Governor Brown, if I, uh, Governor Inslee, you want to yeah, add just, something? Uh, Governor Brown said something that is inspiring for many different reasons. But if you, if you listen to what he has talked about, he's mentioned battery storage a number of times. And we know battery storage technology is absolutely critical to the eventual build out of all the renewable energy we have, because all of our renewable energy is intermittent in some degree. Mm -hmm. So we can't rely on natural gas forever, it's still a fossil fuel. So the development of battery technology is absolutely critical to the eventual uh, accomplishment of Hawaii's goal of 100%. So how do you get there? And this comes back to your question, what do we do? The point I want to make is, so Governor Brown and his leadership provided a pull for that technology, a pull in the sense that it created a market for battery technology because it demanded the utilities to go out and buy it. So he sent a tremendous pull message to the market. Washington has provided a tremendous push message where in our clean energy uh, company development fund, we have assisted companies to go out and actually do the research and development necessary to build that technology. So we provided a push, and as a result of my uh, clean energy fund, one of the companies that's been spun off is Una Energy Muckle Teal, which is building, the, as I said, the biggest vanadium flow battery. It's grid scale storage. These things are as big as trailer trucks. You put them up in sequence, you marry it to a solar or wind farm, and boom, when you're generating wind, even though you're not using it, you put it into your giant trailer sized vanadium flow battery and pump it back into the grid when you need it. The point I would make is, in our policies, we need both a pull which is a carbon cap like we have in my state under my executive order, or cap and trade as we have in California and Quebec, and a push to help these companies get over the valley of death. And they need that. And they need intellectual talent. They need universities to be focused on this. And we're focusing ours, and they're pumping out some great technology. Premier. Yeah, on, the, on the energy, I think a lot of people are missing the true revolution. I'll give you an example uh, in Quebec. A lot of people are, not a lot of people, many people are still pushing for more dams in northern Quebec. And as you know, we have a significant number of these up there. But this is not what's going to take us through the next 20, 25 years. I think the era of big dams uh, may come again, but not in the foreseeable future. What we will see now, and starting to see, is revolution centered about decentralizing of production at the level of the consumer, the homeowner, interacting with the grid in a tra transactional way, smart grids, more renewables let yet, yes, more storage, yes. But I think we've passed the era of this, uh, of this push for big, 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 huge uh, electricity infrastructures and moving down 
at the citizens' level. The only reason Quebec was lately doing this, because Vermont has been doing this uh, for a while now, and other legislations as well, is that our electric fares are so low that there's no in there has been no incentives until now to get to go there. But we're getting there, and in the in the 20s, I think this will be the big revolution in our in our province, but also elsewhere, moving the production of of energy at the homeowner energy producer being being an energy producer and again transacting with with the with the so public. let me um say we're down to our last 30 seconds but we um have had several critical points laid out here um the importance of innovation and the importance of partnership particularly government business so stephen you're our one business guy you've heard government saying what the business community needs to step up to from several of our our governors and the premier from a business point of view what do you need from government I would say collaboration, uh, and we're deeply uh, committed to that. We know that the, the issues are, are serious and significant. Um, commitments are one thing, action is another. Uh, and the, the issues uh, that face us and the scale that they exist at um, are significant and enormous. And it's not just collaboration from, uh, if you will, the United States uh, and, and, and the commitment that exists here on the stage as well as from Canada, but from foreign governments as well. Uh, we, we have to reach deep, not only face into how we generate our energy, but we need to reach deep into our supply chains, which fundamentally have some very serious issues. And we need partnerships with NGOs and with governments uh, writ large to, to, to address this, to come up with the solutions that are needed. Thank you. We are um, running out of time, but have a, a final speaker, Norm Ormstein, who's one of the most thoughtful observers of the political scene, uh, which has come up time and time again as a critical issue. Uh, he's uh, one of the authors uh, with several brilliant co-authors of a new book, one Nation After Trump, a guide for the perplexed, the disillusioned, the desperate, and the not yet deported. <laughs> Norm Ornstein. Thank you, Dan. And uh, what an honor to be uh, up on the stage with this remarkable collection of uh, public servants and uh, business leaders from around the country and the continent. For me, it's a little bit different. I am from Washington, D.C., and have to live in a surreal world in Donald Trump's Washington, D.C. I had to learn a new national anthem, We Shall Overcome. Uh, <laughs> now watch the new uh, reality series, Dancing with the Czars. Uh, uh, and, of course, uh, it's been a remarkable couple of weeks as we have watched Harvey and then Irma and now are awaiting Maria, devastating hurricanes that clearly represent the extreme uh, weather events that are shaped in significant part by the warmer ocean waters that have been caused by climate change and causing economic and human devastation. We have a uh, uh, Environmental Protection Agency director who said, now is not the time to talk about climate change in the midst of hurricanes. Uh, we've had a, uh, a war on science that we've had to deal with. Uh, we have at EPA a uh, directive going out that uh, grants should be flagged if they use the terms climate change or uh, global warming. We have a nominee for NASA who is neither a scientist uh, nor a believer in uh, uh, man-made climate change. Uh, we have an attempt to knock out the weather uh, satellites. It's gotten so depressing for me that I actually began to look into volunteering for the first uh, manned colony on Mars. Uh, <laughs> then I learned that the first person to volunteer for it was Newt Gingrich. Now I, I need a new plan B, uh, uh, obviously. But with all of that, the message that we've heard today is a very heartening one. And we've had World War II analogies. I think Donald Trump may be our Dunkirk, where we had the West at the threat of absolute destruction, and the government did not respond, and civil society was jolted and stepped up to the plate. And what we're seeing now, I think, both because we're having the direct impact of climate change, with these weather events, with the devastation, uh, that, uh, and with a president and an administration that are moving in exactly the wrong direction, is the kind of jolt that's coming. And it's been there with the uh, infrastructure and foundation-led 
by leaders that we see on the stage and others to overcome all of this. For a, an American who's followed and studied and worked with our political system, one of the heartening events is built in by the framers, the states as laboratories of democracy. And now we're seeing laboratories from Hawaii, California, Washington step up. We've seen a federal system in Canada where we see a similar phenomenon. And we're starting to see business leaders now recognize that, and I hope we will see this in places like Texas and Florida where we do not have governors uh, who have the same insights that we've seen here on this stage, and businesses and business leaders perhaps understanding that when you have devastating events, supply chains destroyed, and their businesses affected by this, that we need something different. And there's one other message from today that I will take back and try to use because we clearly need much broader collaborations across civil society, across governments, with business leaders. And that is that responding to climate change is not like taking castor oil. This is not something that is simply painful. It is good business. It is good for the economy. As Governor Inslee said, it creates jobs and you can buy, uh, maybe it'll be an electric pick up the next time around, uh, that this is something that is good across the board. And if we can begin to get those messages across, and if we see the kinds of innovations that we've got here in the states and in the business community, and if we have leaders in universities like Dan coming out of government but bringing those things together, we will overcome, not just overcome. Thank you very much. <laughs> Norm, thank you very much. That was an incredibly brilliant summary of uh, a wide-ranging conversation. And now, please join me in thanking our panelists who've covered so much ground and given us so much hope.